Good evening, everyone. How are you? All right. Don't mind me. I'm just back here just kind of fiddling around. But if you'll stand with me this evening, we're going to worship the Lord, give him praise and glory that he's due. Good 
darkness fills the night It cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies he is always by my side Yes, Lord My strength is in your name For you alone can save You will deliver me Yours is the victory Whom shall I fear? Yeah. 
child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb study your word openly to just rejoice in Jesus Christ our Savior just fill our cups with gratitude Lord we love you tonight and we've just come expecting 
God, just move, Lord. Move among your people. Transform us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Our young people will be dismissed into their classes at this time. All right, well, hello, Bridge Church. Oh, man, we're getting some Sunday morning worship on. You forget, forget it's Wednesday. That's awesome. That is awesome. We are in Hebrews chapter 8. I want you to go ahead and turn there. Uh, short chapter, lot, lot of truth in this. Uh, man, it's, it's like one, one just builds on to the other. And, and this is so practical. This teaching tonight is so practical. If you've come out, of, as I did, if you came out of a workspace religion, um, Catholicism, LDS, Jehovah Witness, where you have, to, you have to do enough to get saved, it's really hard to retrain your brain. Even, even when you get saved, it's hard to retrain your brain to, to just really give God the glory that he's the one that's doing it. And yes, we are saved unto good works. We, we can never forget. Scripture tells us we're saved unto good works. And God desires for us to do things that please him. But it's really the retraining of our brain that can be difficult and, and just getting past that hurdle. And that's really what Hebrews 8 is talking about. And even for people who came up in the church, I know people that grew up in Christian homes but man, they just have such a difficult time. I think we're getting another low end. Uh, just, just drop that low end a little bit. Uh, they have such a difficult time just realizing that the, the, the being saved unto good works part is different from being saved by our good works. And, and really, that's what we want to talk about tonight. So let's jump into uh, the first five verses. Hebrews 8, 1 says, Now the point in which we, what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest that is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. All right, so what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's taking us back even before the temple and he's taking us back to the original tabernacle that Moses built and where the first worship happened, where the first ark was placed or where the ark was first placed. And so what he is talking about here is the seat Jesus occupies. He is seated, he says, at the right hand of the Father. So we talked last week about prophet, priest, and king. There is a throne, which it signifies his kingship, and a sanctuary that deals with his priesthood. On earth, they are distinct places, but in heaven, they're combined. Let's look at, at, at 1 Kings 6.38. In the 11th year of the month of Bull, the 8th month, the temple was finished in all its details according to all its specifications. He had spent seven years building it. It took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the, the construction of his palace. All right, so this is taking us forward in time to the creation of the temple that Solomon built. Now, this was different because it was not given by God to man. The temple was man's offering to God. So David says, I want to build a temple for the name of God. And Nathan the prophet says, hey, man, God is with you. Do whatever you want. Whatever, whatever seems right to you, uh, let your hands just go ahead and do what they want to do. But then Nathan has a, a dream, and God tells him, David is not the man to build the temple. David's not the one. It's going to be his son. David is a man of war. God raised David up. He was a, he was a mighty warrior. He subjugated the Philistines. If you, if you look at the history of Israel, you see that before David's time, Israel was a very, very weak kingdom. They were hiding in caves under Saul. They were being subjugated by the Philistines. In other words, the Philistines would come in at harvest time. They would take their crops. They would steal whatever they wanted. 
And there wasn't anything Israel could do about it. They were very, very weak. David comes along, becomes the prominent military commander in, in that time under King Saul. And he defeats and subjugates the Philistines. David becomes king and extends his reign. And Israel becomes a very powerful kingdom. To the extent that about 40 years later when David dies, he literally lays aside what would be in today's dollars billions, about $20 billion for the construction of the new temple. And so Solomon is the one charged with building this temple. And he finishes it, it says, in all its details according to its specifications. All right, so the, the palace, however, was a separate area. And Solomon builds his palace and, it, and the Bible says, and, and you, know, you know, I'm going to withhold a lot of commentary on this, but it took Solomon nearly twice as long to build his, his palace than it did to build God's temple. I, I, I think his dad might have had those reversed if it was David building it. Um, but these were two distinct areas. The temple was the place of worship and sacrifice. The palace was was the place where the throne room of the king was, and the king would sit on his throne and render judgments for the nation of Israel. In heaven, the Bible tells us they're combined. And so we see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. The Father signifying the authority of the Creator. Right? You create something, you have authority over this. If I created this, or if I created this, I could do whatever I want with it. Because I am its creator, I can do whatever I want. So God sits on the throne as in, in, the, in the place of authority, in the place of judgment. Jesus sits, sits at his right hand as our high priest. And so these two areas in heaven are combined. This will become more, more important, and, and you'll understand this as we go through this. All right, so it's not that man's work was inconsequential, but what the scripture is saying is this is the roadmap that points to the actual destination. The work that was done on the original tabernacle and the work that was done on the temple signify what is actually going on in heaven. And that's why when the tabernacle was, was created, God says to Moses, make sure that you construct it precisely according to the blueprint I've given you. Because this signifies something that is going on in heaven. So when we engage in acts of repentance or sacrifice or worship, we are not cleansing ourselves. We're not recompensing God. What we're doing is we're activating the power that God has implanted in us to overcome sins. I heard somebody, and they were talking about the, the NFL Sunday ticket, and they were fresh. I used to have this years ago. They gave it to me free when I bought DirecTV or something like that. And now it's like 500 bucks. It's getting crazy. So somebody was talking about it because they just moved it to YouTube, and they like, look, on when I had it on satellite, it was easy. It was just, you go to the channel. Now I've got to find it. I've got to set it up. I've got to cast it to my TV. And he makes this statement, and he says, you know, all that good work that I've done in church on Sunday, is going to get undone by how many times I cursed my TV on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> I get the humor, but I think he's missing the point. We don't go to church to amass brownie points, right? I joke around and say, hey, if you get this answer, two free sins. Well, you know what? All our sins are paid, are paid for. So, so that's clearly a joke. But there's some people that really think that they kind of amass that. I, I know of a preacher I know of a preacher that had an affair every Monday for a long period of time because he thought that by the next Sunday he was clean, you know, he was prayed up enough to preach. You see how messed up our thinking can get? I have a friend, uh, his name's Bruno Spada. He pastors in Mystic, Connecticut. You know Mystic Pizza? We don't talk about Bruno. But, uh, but, uh, but Bruno had this saying, he was like, you know, sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. Because what happens when you engage in sin, you begin to try to justify it. And especially if your mind is operating in works, where you have to earn God's love, then what happens is you try to justify sin when you're walking in it. You try to make a, a, a you know, well, this isn't so bad. And this is, you know, I tell, so I remember a woman coming to me, and she was a, a sweet older lady, and she knew that I really was into the history of the Titanic. 
you know, I'd been to the, ex- the exhibit in Boston and I'd, I'd read all about it and long before the movie came out and everything. So the movie comes out and she says, oh, pastor, you should go see that movie. Well, I hadn't seen it, but I'd heard about it. And I said, isn't that the movie where the engaged girl starts, you know, getting on with some other guy and like he paints her naked? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, and you want your pastor to see that? Right. <laughs> see, we, we, will, we will kind of make judgments about our... Here's how you know you're growing, especially if you're a parent. When you change the way you do things in your home, as the Lord shows you more and more of who He is. Because what I, what I had to learn was that God cannot love me more, and He will not love me less. He cannot love me more, and He will not love me less. It's just the nature of who He is. It has nothing to do with me. It's the nature of who God is. And, and so what I really had to learn about that was when I felt that sense of conviction, I have two choices. We're going to talk about this more as we get into these following verses. But I have two choices at that point. I can either justify, self-justify, and well, you know, this isn't so bad, or other people do worse, or there's lots of this stuff going on in the church, or I can recognize it for what it is. It's not condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what it is, is it's the Father's attempt through His Spirit to bring me into alignment with the character and nature of His Son. And so at that moment, I have one of two choices. I can either, I can either try to justify myself, right? That's self-righteousness. This world is, is probably, and we'll look back on this generation, as the most self-righteous generation in all of history. Because, you know, we have things like cancel culture. And you have people who are incredible sinners in the eyes of the Lord. Incredibly sinful based on what God's Word says. Who are going to dismiss and cancel other people because you committed this particular sin. And just this tremendous capacity to justify their own sin or to say it's not sin. Humility before God is recognizing he is in authority. He is seated on the throne. I'm not on the throne. You're not on the throne. And so when I came to Christ, I recognized that if he is creator, and, and I'm, uh, you and I are twice bought, we are purchased by creation. In other words, we are God's possession based on the fact that he created us. We are also God's possession based on the fact that he redeemed us by the blood of his son. And redemption, that's a whole other topic, but redemption is this idea, just like we sang, I'm no longer a slave. So if somebody was in slavery, and this was true in American history, it was true of, of the Hebrews, it was true when they had slaves, you could get out of slavery by either redeeming yourself or somebody else redeeming you. And, that, and what, they was, what that meant was they would pay the price and they would go up to the master and say, how much is this slave worth to you? I want to redeem them and, and they would pay your redemption price and then either you belong to them but, or they could just set you free. They could say you're free to do what you want. And so Jesus Christ redeemed us by his blood and being gracious and being merciful, he doesn't demand that we follow him. He offers it to us. Now there's an Old Testament passage where, let's say a slave was in a home and he was treated well. And the master gave him plenty of of food and let him have a wife and a family and gave him a nice, and that wasn't wasn't uncommon. That happened. We, We hear the horror stories, not that I'm trying to make light of slavery, but there were certainly situations. I just saw a story this week where they had restored a painting from several hundred years ago where somebody had painted over a a young slave in the picture. It was a picture of three white children. And the family had had thought so much. You ever have some you ever see the movie The Blind Side? Where where he's in the where and they, they invite him in and they put him on the Christmas card. Right? Now he's not a born member of the family. But they bring him into the family. Well, this young man was obviously very, very important to this family. The children loved him and saw him as somebody who was an equal. And they commissioned a very expensive painting to put him in there. Now with, you know, laser technology, somebody years later, like a century later, painted over it. Probably a relative who thought that was just inappropriate. Painted over it. Well, somebody got the painting and was able to, you know, look under it with x-ray technology and restore it 
um, and, and put all four figures in it. And so if you were a slave in such a home where you were really treasured and treated well, and the master said to you, you know, you can go, it was not uncommon for a slave to say, I don't want to go. Now, sometimes it was because he wouldn't own his, his wife and family, but sometimes it was because he was very close to his master. And so the master would take him to the, basically the city hall and would pierce his ear with an awl. And that signified that he was a part of that household for life. He was voluntarily. If you were, for example, a Jewish slave, you could only be held in captivity up to the year of Jubilee. But again, maybe that slave says, I don't want to leave. You know, I'm, <laughs> for some people, they just, this is all I know. Many, even after the Civil War, many slaves went back to the plantation. That's all they knew. That's all they knew. And so the master would pierce the slave's ear. Well, this is a picture of us. Because Jesus Christ sets us free, and then we voluntarily, like I love what Paul says, I am a doulos of Christ. And, and it's often translated servant, but that word means slave. That's how Paul identified himself. I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Because Paul wrote things like, and he was talking about sin, but he says, a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. And so I will not be mastered by sin, but I voluntarily yield to the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is sitting on the throne. And so when you become a Christian, his word becomes, that's the authority over my life. That's what binds us together. I, w I was talking to my mom the other day because she lived in Switzerland many, many years. Uh, my dad was the dean of faculty at a university there. And I said, how long would it take you to become Swiss? <laughs> she said, generations. I said, how long would it take you to become Japanese if you moved to Japan? Oh, you couldn't. You'd never be Japanese. How long would it take you to become Chinese if you moved to China? I don't know. Maybe your grandchildren. You know how long it takes to become an American? Months. As soon as you can take the citizenship oath, as soon as you pass that, you become an American. Why? Because our Constitution is what binds us together. Because even though we may have vastly different political views, even though we have vastly different religious views, we have all agreed that this document will be our authority. This will be, now we, again, we have, have a younger brother who's a very prominent attorney, and we have people that interpret it very differently. But at its core, we all say we're Americans because it's not where we were born, it's not our race, it's not our ethnicity, it's not our status, it's that we submit ourselves to the Constitution of the United States. As Christians, as Christians we submit ourselves to the authority of the Word of God. And if God's Word says that, I, I had a, a guy who got hired on staff at a church I was, I was attending, and I was working with youth, and I was out playing basketball with the kids. It was in inner city Miami, and we'd play basketball because the neighborhood around there, incredibly dangerous neighborhood. I, I think I shared this that uh, one night Ruth and I were driving. We, we drove home, and it was about 25 miles to our house. So we get home, and I turn on the TV, and there's a, a live shot of a helicopter taken off from the church parking lot because uh, that was the only place they could land a helicopter. It's Miami, it's a city. So it was the only place they're, they're able to land a helicopter. Somebody had been shot in the head at a Wendy's right up the street. And so a lot of the kids in the neighborhood were afraid, obviously, to go out at night and play in the park. So what we would do is on Friday nights, we would have uh, Ruth played basketball in, in uh, or not basketball, Ruth played volleyball in, in high school. And so she would, would take the young ladies and they'd play volleyball and I'd go out with the young guys and we'd play basketball. And then we would have, we would have a, a Bible study. And one night I had a, a, a youth leader come up and he was very upset about the type of t-shirt I was wearing to play basketball. And I just thought, uh, he's like, because it had like an opening on the side and I'm like, dude, I weigh 105 pounds. I look like, you know, a Gumby or a stick figure. Nobody's, nobody's lusting after me, trust me. But, but he was so upset and I just said to him, and I also had long hair and that really frosted him and, and you know, he was really disturbed by, by a lot of things about me. But one of the things I did was I said, if you can show me in the word where what I'm doing is wrong, I'll change it. Show me in the word not your opinion, not your church background, but show me in the word what, where what I'm doing is wrong and I'll change what I'm doing. 
And that has been such a blessing. And so, sometimes we look at it like it's a burden. But in my, in my family, uh, our devotions lately, we've been reading through Psalm 119. That's like 180 verses. So, you know, you break it up. But the writer continually is talking about, I love your commands. How I love your law. And we're, we look at it, how can you love a law? Well, let me tell you something. If you had lived in that time, and you were part of the cultures around, it would not be uncommon to sacrifice your firstborn child. It would not be uncommon for somebody to, to just take you and, and put you into slavery. And there's no recourse and no way out. It was, it was not uncommon to see all sorts of vile pagan practices that were just terrible and, and hideous and horrible. And here comes the law. And the law protected people. The law said, and, 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 and just imagine how radical this is. Here's a bunch of slaves that go out into the desert. And 40 years later, they come out with the most advanced moral code that humanity had ever known. In those 613 laws that, that Moses wrote down. And they protected people from slavery. They protected women from, from rape. They, prote- they, they, they had this code that, that didn't differentiate if you, if, you, if you killed this person. And this is where we still get these ideas of first degree murder and second degree murder. Did you do it intentionally? Did you do it accidentally? What's the, what's the recourse if it's an accidental type of thing? What does it mean if it, if it, just, if it just happened in like a bar fight or if somebody premeditated the murder. And, and so there were, there were all sorts of nuances. And so the writer of, of Psalm 119 is saying, how I love your law. Because he's looking at, at the difference between the law that the Jews had. And the way that the pagan nations ran their business. And how arbitrary things could be. And how, how violent things could be. You know, we look at Mayan culture and we're like, wow, that's shocking to the senses. But that wouldn't have been unusual. If you lived in the time where the Psalms were being written, human sacrifice, infanticide, that stuff wouldn't have been uncommon at all. And so he's saying, I love your law. It sets us apart. This is, this is so obviously elevated above the nations around us. And so when we look at the authority of God, either we're going to look at it as a burdensome thing, oh, I've got to do this, or we're going to realize that God's authority is what elevates us. That as God speaks to us and God says, you know, I want you to lay this down. It's not because God is angry with us. It's because he wants us to become more like his son. All right, so the Bible refers to the majesty in heaven. The Bible refers to the majesty in heaven. And, and this is something that we have to recognize because when you call somebody your majesty on earth, we're speaking of their position, right? So if you were to go meet the, the king of England, yes, yes, your majesty. You're speaking of his position. When you're talking about the majesty of God, you're talking about his nature. He is majestic by nature. Everything I've seen of King Charles, not a whole lot majestic about the guy. Right? I mean, I, I just... I remember watching Prince Charles and Lady Di getting married saying, dude, I don't care if you're a prince. You just, you, you're punching way above your weight class. Man, I mean, that's way, that's way above. You, you, you would never have a shot unless you were a prince. And then he messed that up and had an affair. And it's like, so I look at the guy and I don't think he's majestic by nature. So why would you call him your majesty? Position, right? When you go to, to, to court, yes, your honor. I don't know if he's honorable. The posi- oh, we, we respect the position, right? If you were to go to the White House, you may not like the president, but you would say, yes, Mr. President, because you're grateful for the opportunity. And that's something we've lost in our culture, right? I think about Paul and, and, and Jesus and, and the, the, the rule. I mean, think about, go study Nero and Tiberius. These are lunatics, Tiberius was the, the, the emperor during Jesus' time. Nero was the one that had Peter and Paul executed. Lunatics, tyrants, and yet what does Paul say? Pray for them. Pray for them. Live peaceable lives and lift them up. See, it's, it's fine as Americans if you want to you know, say, hey, this is wrong with our system and this needs to be fixed and I think this person, we have that right to do that. We don't, you don't have that right in North Korea. 
You don't have, I remember a, a Russian comic who defected to the United States. And he said, you know, Russia is not so different from America. In, Russia, in America, you say, I hate the president of the United States, and you're allowed. In Russia, you say, I hate the president of the United States, and you're allowed. <laughs> See, same thing. You're allowed, under your First Amendment rights, to complain about what's going on in your country. But you're commanded by the authority of the word that you said over you to pray for them. And so when somebody comes up to me and they're complaining and they're, I say, do you pray as much as you complain? Because if you complain more, just being blunt with you, then you've put the first amendment above the word of God. What is your ultimate authority? My ultimate authority is God. I can love my country. I can appreciate my freedoms. But my ultimate authority does not reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. My ultimate authority sits on the throne in heaven. That's, the, you know, and when it comes to a choice between the two, I'm going to choose my heavenly citizenship every single time. Because that is, that's my eternal, right? I, I have a temporary visa right now. You and I are on temporary visas. We don't know when the expiration date is. But nobody is a citizen of any country once they're put in the ground. You have no citizen rights. You can't vote except in Chicago. You can't vote once you're dead. Once you're dead, you can't vote. Once you're dead, you can't decide where your house goes. Once you're dead, you, you better do all that stuff while you're still alive. Because once you're dead, you have no rights. You have no citizen rights. But when I take my last breath on earth, I still have all my heavenly rights. Because I will be a citizen of that kingdom forever. I'm on a temporary visa. So, so imagine you want to go and you want, like my dad did, and he wanted to work, he had to get a work visa to go work in Switzerland. Now he was, a, he was an employee there for years. But he always had an American passport because he was an American citizen. I'm, a, I'm, I'm on a temporary visa in the United States of America. I appreciate the country. Like I said, I come from a military family. Many of my relatives have, have shed blood for this country. But ultimately, my citizenship is in heaven. And that's something we always have to remember because if we're going to, look, I can't fix what's going on in the world. I can't change what's going on in any other church. But in the church I lead, I'm going to make sure that people understand the word of God is our ultimate authority. Because one of the things that the world is so bothered by is the hypocrisy of what they see in the church. And like I said, we can't do anything about what's going on in any other church. But we can say at the Bridge Church, yes, we all have our viewpoints. We all have our backgrounds. We all have our opinions. But all of those things bow the knee to Jesus Christ. When we gather together, it's Him we're exalting. It's Him we're lifting up. It's Him we're worshiping. And, 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 and if the world sees that, they're going to say, there's something different about your church. Something different about you guys, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you, you guys have your opinions. You guys have your background. You come from different classes. But when you gather for worship, it's all about him. And so that's what we have to recognize, that we, we, we worship a king that is not on his throne because he inherited it or because he conquered somebody else. He simply is majestic. It's his nature. He has majesty. And Jesus, the son, offered himself not simply to pay our debt, but for him to be qualified to occupy the position of high priest for humanity. As we're going to see later, there is one mediator between man and God. So you have the majestic authority of the father, and you have broken humanity, and you have the mediator in between, Jesus Christ, who is drawing us near. How many times do we see in Scripture, draw near to me, draw close to me, right? This is, what God, this is what God wants. Jesus' earthly ministry was not to prepare himself for further earthly ministry. Jesus' earthly ministry was to prepare himself to sit on the throne as the high priest so that he could be that mediator that we're going to talk about in later chapters. All right, so let's take a look at verse at verse uh, 6 through the, through the rest of the ch chapter. As it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much, as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better. 
since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So, so pause right here and realize that God is speaking in the Old Testament during the Old Covenant and saying, I will establish a new covenant. It's going to supersede the old. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the hand, land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. All right, so he's talking about the covenant that we are in right now. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. All right, so let's talk for a few minutes, about 10, 15 minutes about this ministry of the new covenant. Now, he makes the point, Jesus' ministry is immeasurably significant to the earthly. It is absolutely necessary. This is the bridge between those covenants. All right, so recognize the purpose of the law. He's saying the new covenant, I'm gonna write their, my laws in their minds and on their hearts. This is done by the Spirit. This is why we have to be so careful not to engage in the practice of self-justification. When we say to God, well, that's not so bad. What we're doing is we're pushing away. The Spirit comes in and says, hey, you need to put that down. Well, that's not so bad. We're pushing the counsel of the Spirit away. We're teaching ourselves to ignore the counsel of God. And we're gravitating towards rules. And that's what happens in a lot of churches. It's what happens to a lot of Christians. They gravitate towards rules instead of sensitivity to the Spirit. And so we have to train ourselves recognizing God is speaking to our minds and to our hearts by His Word and by His Spirit so as to cleanse us. And, and through Jesus, we become like Him. So we become like, we, we inherit or establish the characteristics of God in our lives. So Jesus is not simply superior in efficacy, meaning effectiveness, but also in foundation, also in foundation, meaning the new ministry deals with deficiencies that the previous one could not. The new ministry deals with who we are at our core. It deals with issues of conscience. Again, we're going to talk about this more in coming chapters, so I don't want to get too far ahead of us. But what the writer is doing is saying the foundation for this is different from the old. What the old did was revealed our defect. That's, that was the purpose. If you want to boil down the purpose of the Old Testament law, it was to show you and I that we're broken and messed up. That was the point. You would try to keep it, and you couldn't. You would regularly fail. And every time you had to go up the hill and put your hand on an animal and watch the priest plunge the knife into it so that your sins were placed on that animal, you were reminded vividly that you were still defective. Now, like I said, by the time of Jesus, the religious leaders had said, yes, but we are better. We're still better. They're, they're, I keep, you know, 523, and they only keep 389. So that makes me better. That's not the point. If you miss heaven by that much, you still miss heaven, right? And that's why I've said half-jokingly, but with some, some abs there's truth to it. There's two ways to heaven. People say, no, it's only Jesus. No, nope, there's two ways to heaven. Live a perfect, sinless life from birth to death, and you'll go to heaven. God will not cast anyone into hell who lived a perfect, sinless life because the wages of sin is death. Everybody in this room is past that option. I hate to break it to you. You're past that option. And so the only option open to us is the righteousness of Christ. 
That's the only thing left to us. And so the righteousness of Christ can and will perfect us. It will perfect us. There will be no one in heaven who is not walking in righteous perfection. We're not simply going to put on a garment that covers. That's grace. Think of grace like a robe that covers. You ever see like even during COVID and you would have doctors and they'd have to operate on somebody who was very, very contagious and they'd have like an outfit, right, that completely covered them because in, and somebody walking into if you ever see like the movie Contagion or something like that and there's these surgeons and they're operating on the person. Well, what it is is God, God is not wearing the, the outfit. We're wearing the outfit. Because it covers us so that the holiness of God can interact with the sinfulness of man. Otherwise, there's no way to do that. What fellowship hath light with darkness? You can't make oil and water mix. But think of grace as like a garment that, is, that covers us so that God sees us through the righteousness of his son, through what Jesus did. But you and I know we're still messed up, right? I'm covered with grace. I'm covered with the blood of the Lamb. And God sees me in that redeemed state because of what Jesus did. All my sins are paid for, but I'm still broken, right? That's what Paul says. Not that I've been made perfect. (laughs) Not that God's done with me yet. and, And so all of us, if we're being honest, God, why am I still struggling with this? Why do I still deal with this? And we inhabit this flesh that is so sinful it can't be redeemed. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We'll put on new tabernacles. We'll be just like the picture of the old tabernacle and the temple. We go from this tabernacle to a perfect physical presence and, and, and existence where we can't be tempted and we're sinless. But in my core, I'm still not perfect. I'm still not like Jesus. So grace is that temporary solution by which the surgeon, the master, can operate on us. Ultimately, I will clothe myself in heaven with the righteousness of Christ. So I'm not just going to have this robe that covers my sin so that God sees me as holy. I'm actually, Scripture says, going to be like constitutionally, compositionally. I will be like Christ. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. No longer will a man say, know the Lord. You should know. He said, they will all know him, right? Down to the core, just even, even more intimately than Adam knew the Lord. We will know the Lord. And so this is what Jesus is doing for us now. Look at what Paul says in Romans. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good. In other words, when God gave those laws, those were good. Thou shalt not kill. That's good. Thou shalt not worship an idol. That's good. The problem is, I'm not good. And so when God says, don't do something, you ever tell a two-year-old, don't take a cookie out of the cookie jar. They didn't even want the cookie till you said it. As soon as you said it, though, now they have to have that cookie. And that's what Paul says. It's not that what was good became death in me, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. All right, so you're driving down the road. Speed limit is is 40 miles an hour. You don't know that. You're driving 100 miles an hour. Are you breaking the law? Of course you are. If the cop pulls you over, can you say, but I didn't know? Nope. It doesn't matter. The law is what it is. And it's because you're breaking the law, you're a transgressor. Now, as soon as you see speed limit 40, now you have a choice to make, right? Now you know the law, but try not to speed, (laughs) right? I know what it says, but maybe I'll just go 50 instead of 100. You're still breaking the law. And that's what Paul's saying. It's not that what was good produced death in me, It's that I was already sinful, and once the law came, it revealed my sin. And it said, so that through the commandments, sin might become utterly sinful. So the law was not designed to bring righteousness. The fault was not found with God or with the law, but with us, with mankind. It's our fault. We were broken just because we didn't know we were broken. The fault was found with man. 
But instead what God did, instead of judging us, and he could have, he could have just blown this world into oblivion and started over. He reacted with mercy and he gives us the new ministry and the new ministry reveals God. And see, that's the fundamental difference. The old ministry revealed our sin. So the Old Testament comes or the Old Covenant comes and it reveals us. It reveals us as being sinners. The new covenant comes and it reveals who God is. The old covenant was not primarily designed as a revelation of God. It was designed as a revelation of our need for God. And so, verse 10 doesn't say, I will put my law, which would have meant the Old Testament. He says, laws. In other words, his commands. He'll put on our hearts and minds. So that we will instinctively, reflexively know what is pleasing to God. And as we're walking in the Spirit, and if you've, you know, most of us have experienced this. Where we're watching something and it seems fine and all of a sudden it just goes dark. Right? Oh, nope. TV off. How would you know that? How'd you know that? The Spirit revealed that to you. Now, some of us will just, you know, <laughs> I, I, I paid for this movie. I paid 12 bucks for this movie. I don't want to. Uh, my friend Kenny Lewis um, is very close friends with the lead singer for Striper, Michael Sweet. He lived in, Michael actually introduced me to Kenny years ago. And Michael still, I mean, he's just an amazing voice. Daniel loved Striper and would play it when we'd have work days. And just the guys, you know, 58 years old and he's just got this you know he can hold these screams for like 30 seconds unbelievable other people can't even sing anymore and he can still do this well the two of them went out to a movie they were in the studio and they were working and they said let's go out and see a movie here's these two big metal guys right long hair and everything in Boston they go and they see the movie about 10 minutes in something happens and they're like yeah let's go right they're just (laughs) getting up no we're out of here too big now you're, you're supposed to be this big tough metal head how can anything surprise you you've seen it all man even you know you've these guys have been on tour and they would go on tour with bands like slayer and everything because they saw it as an opportunity to witness to people that were really caught up in darkness so you've seen all kinds of darkness in your ministry How, how's that come on that's just you know this is a waste of money you just spent you know 14 bucks on the th- on the movie and now you're going to walk out because i can't control what I see as I walk through the world. But I can control what I set before my own eyes. And that's what the psalmist says, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. Now that's in the law. That's in the old covenant. But the spirit comes along and you're sitting at the theater and you see something and it's like, nope, I just don't want to be seen here. I don't want anybody thinking that I support this. And if somebody sees me going out of it, I can always say, you know what? I had no idea that was in that. And as soon as that came on the screen, I left. And that's a much better witness to than, yeah, I didn't want to blow my 14 bucks. Right? That, and that's what a lot of us do. All right, so this is what we have to recognize. The old covenant could not be established without the fulfillment of the old, or the new covenant couldn't be established without the fulfillment. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? I, I, I bring to completion the purpose of the old covenant. It, and that's why when Jesus hung on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. This Sunday when we share communion, Jesus, and, and I just, because I love just thinking about it, how he sits down at the beginning of this long holiday meal where they would have course after course. And the first course comes out and it's the bread. And normally a rabbi would take it and dip the bread in the wine and hand some to his disciples. Instead, he breaks the bread and he says, this is my body given for you. This is the fulfillment of the old covenant. The ultimate sacrifice that pays all the penalties is, is, now, is now here. So they have their meal and their lamb and their vegetables and all that they would have and hours go by and conversation and we know during this Judas betrayed him and he goes off. So this long evening, the very end of the meal, when as we do today, you would take another, you know, take a sip just to cleanse your palate. Jesus takes the cup. When supper was ended, scripture says, he took the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so to me, communion takes on, because I grew up Catholic and it was just something you did every week, it takes on such a great significance when you meditate on what it means. We break the bread 
The old is done. The law has no power. It is now broken. It is fulfilled in the body of Christ. We drink the cup by his blood. We are washed. We are saved. We take that cup, like Jesus said in John chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And so we, we symbolically recognize that that's what we're doing. We're reminding ourselves what is actually going on in the supernatural. The old covenant is not abolished. It is fulfilled in Christ. Matthew 5, 18. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And everything that the law was sent to do, which was to reveal the defectiveness of humanity. Man, people won't even argue that anymore. You, you, want, to, you want to witness to somebody? Start with the defectiveness, the vile depravity of humanity. Because I don't care who you're talking to. Do you think humanity is operating as it should? Right? No. And if somebody is trying to say there's no God, then my argument is, but wait, if there's no God, then it's just evolution, right? Shouldn't, we, shouldn't it all be survival of the fittest? Shouldn't it just be the strongest should survive? What, why is it wrong to be racist? I mean, it's the most natural thing in the world. From, from time immemorial, when two tribes would come together, it always meant war, conflict, or one culture being you know, uh, uh, just subsumed into the other. That's what it always meant. So, so every culture is, is, has practiced racism. Why is it wrong? Because we know it's wrong. Because when I look at somebody else whose skin color is different, I'm not just a child of God. They're a child of God too. They, they bleed like I bleed. And so even though Darwinian evolution may say, hey, that's the most natural thing, my creator says, but I created them, and I created them in my image. And they possess what we call the imagio deo, the image of God. And so they cannot be hated by the color of their skin or their background or anything else. We, they're, they're to be loved and accepted. And so when you're talking to somebody who's lost, and you say, but do you think we're broken? Because if we're broken, it means that there is a right standard we're not aspiring to. And that's where you can begin that whole conversation of if there's a right standard and if we all agree that humanity is not operating all the murders, all the assaults, all the rapes, all the robberies, all the filthy words that are spoken, all the racial hatred that's going on, we all agree. Our world is broken. And so that's the old. We take the communion, we break it. The sin is now broken and paid for with the blood of Christ. And there is now a new covenant where his spirit comes and teaches us how we can walk and think and act like Jesus Christ. So that it becomes natural to us. So that one day when I put on that new, that new body, that new tabernacle, it's now a perfect fit. My inner man has been renewed. I am now given a righteous outer body and I live in a righteous, holy kingdom. And all of us are gonna take that first breath and go, I'm home, I'm home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. God, this world is not my home. I thank you for every blessing and I'm so grateful, God, for this church. Grateful for my brothers and sisters. Grateful for my wife. So grateful for my children. Grateful, Lord, for my health. Grateful for, for you letting me live in a country where we can, we can just meet together and study and worship openly. But Lord, it's not my home. And Father, one day I want to breathe and take my first breath of the air of heaven and realize my inner man and my outer man and my whole environment has been aligned, Lord, that I am a true citizen of your kingdom. So Father God, as we worship every time we meet, and as we study every time we meet, and as the word is preached every time we meet, Lord God Almighty, help us to enter the doors of this building and say, God, today, make me a little more like Jesus. Make me a little more a citizen of your kingdom through worship, through the body of Christ, by your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.